Welcome back to Sunless Skies. In last episode, we went to the Most Serene Mausoleum and spoke with one of the other clay men that the clay conductor wanted us to talk to, see if they could find somebody to join their choir. They didn't have the right type of voice, though. So we'll have to go back to the Reach and go to Magdalene's to follow up on that quest some more. And now I'm at the Home Bureau. Um, I already let out the courtier, gave them uh, the pardon. I already got a port report. Uh, I think I already bought everything from here. Yeah, the only thing left to do is I want to go back into the Quiet Sea. I don't know if there's anything I can do there, because I think I needed a bunch of literature now that I think about it to like offer to the person who first welcomed us in, into their into their cult. I don't think we really joined their cult, but they, they welcomed us. And yeah, I think to go anywhere we need to give them a bunch of literature, but let's go. I don't think it costs anything, really. Approach the gate. What did that do? What did that do? I don't remember. Uh, sixty-one percent chance to succeed. Oh Jesus Christ! That gained a lot of terror. I gained fifteen terror. Okay, I'm never doing that again. And I got one sky story. Woohoo! Thanks. Fuck. The air is still and frigid. Your teeth chatter. Ice flows drift by in the mists. The gate is far from the flotilla. Your breath freezes in the air. A little craft loosely moored to the rest appears serviceable. Oars nest in the berth. Have we read this before? Is there wings in there? Yeah, actually I have read that before. Okay, uh, return to the flotilla. So we've already seen all that. Um, yeah, I remember I could choose to like basically not really pledge my allegiance, but start to bend towards one of the, I think, three cults by choosing where I'll sleep at night, but I don't want to do that until I know more about them. Like, I'm not going to abandon my total journey. Silent Mystic won't talk with me. Illuminator Archivist, I'm pretty sure they're the ones who wanted all the... Yep, five Ministry Approved Literature. Which is actually pretty expensive if I buy them at full price. They were a hundred sovereigns each from Perdurance. That's 500 sovereigns just to do that. Okay, well, I'm obviously not doing any of these things. Let's get out of here. Right, well, I want to go exploring, but I want to go back to London first because I have a lot of things in my hold. Yeah, a bunch of bargains that I've bought. Seven souls, five munitions. Let's go back there, drop those off, and restock myself. Restock. <laughs> restock instead of restock. I've also noticed when I load back into the game, sometimes it brings me back in not centered in the port like this. I'm like on the very edge of it, which is very disturbing because I could so easily hit the side if I, I think if I just go forwards a little bit and turned, turned uh, counterclockwise, I think my butt would slam against this. But if I just go straight, I think I'm fine. Yeah. Weird. Anyway, see you back at London. Ah, another one of these things. These things increase your terror, don't they? At least I got a sky story. Oh, shit. Holy shit. Those rockets are terrifying. What exactly are those? Should I fight one? No, they... I think those explosions might actually have like a blast radius. They look pretty large. I'm just going to keep going. They seem really nasty. Discontent. Oh, right. 58%. Star going out? Yes. Uh, dispense an additional ration of brandy. Down to 53. The bookworm. A wreck. Stripper for repairs. I, I think I'm only hurt by like one. So let's not do that. Let's... Force open the doors to the hold. 61% chance of success. Failure. Lost a crew member. I think it's the first time I've lost a crew member in Albion. Your crew attach cables to the wreck to hold it steady as they pry apart the doors. Um, a sudden gust of wind rocks both vessels and the young man straining at the pry bar slips. He cries out, his hand mangled on a torn edge of metal. Ugh, he's likely to lose his fingers. The treasure retrieved from the hold will be little comfort to him. Oh, that's sad. I guess the 
good thing is that the, they didn't actually die, though. The crew just... I guess we lost crew because they can't work anymore. They're really badly injured, but they're not dead. That's a comfort, I guess. Clasped jewelry box. 24 sovereigns. Jesus. Yeah, that's a little comfort. Let's get repaired back in London. It's gonna cost, what, like, six sovereigns? Yeah. Let's hire on crew members. Handful of crew, what does that cost? 40. Success lowers their cost. Okay, 34% chance of success. There's no shortage of old hands and eager youngsters. Keen to seek a fortune among the stars. Oh, success. 20 sovereigns. The crew you pick have become firm friends over repeated dockside card games. Glad that you're keeping them together. They're willing to accept a lower signing fee. Keeping them together? I only took one. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's turn to my port reports. I think I have two. Yep. What can I get from the port reports, by the way? I can't keep, like, I can't make the bookkeeper like me more. Like I did a while ago. That was just to get in with the new street line. Now I can get a Savage Secret, Unlicensed Chart, Invitation to Berdurance. I have a lot of gratitude saved up, actually, because I got a bunch when I donated the Charlotte Guest to the new street line. I guess it doesn't hurt to trade favor for, like, an Invitation to Berdurance. I think I only have one left. Sure. New total, 10. Yeah. That, uh, new total 10 of gratitude, that is. Two for the invitations. The bookkeeper shakes his head as he passes an invitation over. On another sheet, he scrawls a warning. It's a cage, though the bars are pretty. He underlines the next sentence twice. Her Majesty makes cages for us all. <laughs> so, it's time to explore. I want to go find the Clockwork Sun. I have a prospect to deliver three candies of tea to them. It says it lies east, northeast. Putting it about here or so. So I've got the three guys of tea and then as much fuel and supplies as I can take. Let's go. Let's go explore. Let's see what other horrible things I find in Albion. This place really is very horrible. Here we go. Into the unknown. Just some graves behind me. By the way, on one of the loading screens where the game shows you like a little tip or hint or a little bit of story stuff. The last one I saw... Oh look, more graves. Um, the last one I saw said something really interesting about Eleutheria. It said the sun in Eleutheria... Uh, I forgot the exact wording, but... said that in opposition to its peers, it has decided to turn Eleutheria into a place of lawless night. As in, it sounds like the sun in Eleutheria is alive, but let's pause for a second, that's a nasty thing that shoots huge rockets. It sounds like it is alive, it's not dead, but it's choosing to not make light. Which sounds absolutely fascinating. I wonder if it's a bit of a... a revolutionary or a rebel amongst its peers, the other suns, because suns normally seem to be very tyrannical. Maybe that one would be one I would like to know? Can I speak with the sons? I don't, I don't really know if I can just be like, hey, what's up? Anyway, do I want to fight this thing? It shoots rockets with big explosion radiuses that look like they do a lot of damage and they move very fast. Hmm. Fuck it, let's try.
shit. I was hoping to kill it in one blow right there. There we go. Whew. A resurrectionist. That's so they're not even marauders or anything. I've never encountered one before. Or never killed them anyway. The resurrectionist haunt memoriam, plundering its graves for corpse goods and cadavers. They sell the valuables to pawn shops and the bodies to disgraced scholars, deranged artists, and grisly collectors. Oh my god. I'm not sure exactly what memoriam is, but giving they're plundering the dead, I'm guessing it's basically all of all of these grave sites. Dun Dunches Grant and Lee's Lays and whatnot. They're just grave robbers. Resurrectionists. It's an interesting name. The cabin has been packed with gravelly sky eyes to keep it cold. Corpses hang from a rail. Oh, just dawned on me. They're not just grave robbers. Plundering its graves for corpse goods and cadavers. So they're not just robbing the graves. They're taking the bodies for what? What are they doing with the bodies? Giving them to deranged artists and grizzly collectors, I guess. What am I going to gain? Two tales of terror and a savage secret. As you are, so were we. A cabin has been opened to the cold for the better preservation of the dead. The resurrectionists keep their handful of corpses admirably catalogued. The old dangle with the old, the young hang with the, hang with the young. A neat logbook records their provenance and items collected. Yeah, fuck these people. God, horrible. Cry havoc. <laughs> You're a disturbance and... Oh dear, it must be the dog again. The baritone percussion of his barking echoes through the locomotive. There's a pressing question to consider. Where's the noise coming from? The rat's nesting area. Rats. The inadvisably big dog might have gone after your adorable, vicious rodents. Best check he's alright. The rat's quarters are even more calamitously messy than before. A thin sheet of saliva coats everything, including some of the rats. No one takes notice of you. Both the rats and the inadvisably big dog are preoccupied. Grab that dog! You leap forward, hands closing around the inadvisably big dog's tail. A mistake. His excitement knows no pause, no wait. The inadvisably big dog drags you along as he tears through the rat's quarters, barking rapturously. Eventually you manage to crawl up onto the dog's back and wrestle him to the floor. With the help of the rats, you wrestle the fluffy menace out. <laughs> I love that dog. The Glaze Brook. Gleams with, gleams with frost, its windows are dark, its engine's silent. 61% chance of success. Well, I know from experience, if I fail this, I'll lose a crew. Force him open! Ah, fuck. Lost another crew. Another crew mangled their hand within days of each other. Should probably learn my lesson, huh? But hey, at least we got 17 sovereigns. Oh, this is a new song. I'm going to let you listen to it. It's very peaceful, but melancholy. Three sorts of soul wander this broken stretch of sky. The quick, the dead, the mad. Did 
Didn't mean to shoot. Got an otherworldly artifact. <gasps> that must be the clockwork sun. Oh, I'm so curious what I can do here. I'm curious what it looks like. Oh, it's getting awfully bright, isn't it? Dazzling. Oh, shit. Skyfair is exposed to the haunting light of the stars, I guess even the clockwork sun, are prone to sudden obsessions and erratic behavior. Someone's been making subtle amendments to your navigator's calculations, presumably in an attempt to alter your course. Culprit is discovered to be a reticent engineer. What should I do with them? Issue an additional ration of brandy to the crew. 5% error reduction. Uh, we've seen this before. Sky shanties and, and whatnot. Everybody's happy. Classic. Dazzling radiance washes your engine in a gleaming tide. Glory, glory, glory. I can barely even read the text. It's so radiant. Whoa. Is it the clockwork sun's light that's causing the crystallization of things? There's a lot of crystal here, and it's all pointing in the direction of the clockwork sun. What are you? Oh. Oh, is that a dreadnought? It is. Fuck. HML Heart's Reason. Sun's light glows in your windows, the colored thickness of old cream. I, don't, I didn't take any damage, did I? No. I think I started getting terror like this is a horror, though. The clockwork sun. Navigation suite. Ministry stamp permit. Yes, there's... Uh, I think the clockwork sun is a horror. Whoa. Oh my god. Holy shit. The cutting the princess stares down the clockwork sun. She says nothing. My god, this thing. It's monstrous. I'm gonna go around this whole area. Uh... I think I can go this way. It looks like I'm about to get eaten up by the gears, but I, I think it's all below us. Right? I think I'm think I'm safe to go here. Fucking hell, this looks scary. Ugh. You risk a direct glance at the clockwork sun. It is the gold of toffee. Ugh. Gold of toffee wrappers, not of fire. <laughs> Is my terror ever going to stop going up? Like, I thought it only went up like 10% or so, and then it stopped. Jesus Christ. I don't care, I'll take it, just to see this incredible thing. I don't want to know what would happen if you got caught up in the pistons and whatnot of the gears. Instant death? Clobbered? So it's surrounded by these three things. These three buildings. Management buildings, maybe. The 
light of the clockwork sun oozes into your cabin like rancid honey. What the hell is wrong with this thing? What is wrong with this thing? What have they built? Sunspur. The dock is rarely used and its maintenance has elapsed. There is evidence of rust and metal strain, but only of non-crucial components. It's safe to stop, for now. Once inside the dock, the sun's scoring, scouring light is diminished. Let's check the bazaar first. Oh, right, the tea. I forgot all about that. Um, a solitary foreman asks you to wheel the tea through empty corridors to a storeroom. It's stacked with identical, unopened, dust-covered crates. Either the sun's engineers don't like tea. Unthinkable. Or there are fewer of them, fewer of them than is presumed. Got a mystery stamp permit. An expulsion of problematic material, aka munitions. The dazzled sequencer sells buckets full of armaments retrieved from azimuth. Terrible hazard, all these instruments of lethality lying about the place, and most untidy. Keen to get them off the sun. Very keen. They, what, they don't want buckets of munitions around a sun? <laughs> what could go wrong? <coughs> Excuse me. D... The... D-commissary? Glass. A cheerful signboard lists the goods on offer. Her Majesty's finest coal and Her Majesty's finest stained glass sunproof windows. No comestibles, though. Nothing edible grows here. Comestibles? I've never seen that word before. Huh. Apparently comestibles just means food. Food or, or foods. That's it. Sounds like a very old or British or both word. Comestible. Arrival at the sun, an outpost on the roaring edge of the sun shielded from malevolent light by an eggshell of stained glass. Man, look at that portrait of the clockwork sun over here. That thing looks scarily powerful. As you emerge from your train, suit-swaddled engineers gather, plainly astonished by your arrival. They bombard you with complex questions about how you dealt with dense sunlight and skewed chrono-solar fields. Once satisfied, they hand out protective suits to you and your crew. Yours is patched and torn, one boot missing. You successfully reach the clockwork sun. Shrug into your suit. An engineer sprays you with a substance that smells like lemons gone wrong and searches your pockets. A cursory effort at best. They seem distracted. Didn't... I have a vague memory of somebody saying that there's something wrong with the clockwork sun. Oh right, didn't... Somebody or something say that it's been getting dimmer? They seem distracted. Maybe that's why this clockwork sun is dying. Sunlight seeps like syrup through cracks in the stained glass ceiling. The floor shudders in time with the churning machinery far beneath your feet. The air has a tang of chemicals, bonfires, and rain. Pistons pump, cogs turn, and suit-swaddled figures tend the engineering, bellowing over the shrieking metal. Let's write a board report. All oh, right, the strength of the sun. You unlocked this with the strength of the sun 40, uh, 47. You needed 40. I remember I did something at one point that lost me a little bit of the strength of the sun. The clockwork sun is the preeminent symbol of the Empire's heavenly dominion. The newspaper in London call it enduring, everlasting, eternal. The heart of the Empire. In response to your questions, the engineers shrug. The day dawns, the sun brightens. The night comes, the sun dims. What more is there to say? Some of them seem so exhausted they can barely stand. They insist it's proximity to the sun that affects their sleep. You now have one yearning burning. What does that mean? Is it sun's affecting me just because I'm spending time here? Des descend to the vaults beneath the surface. Let's head towards the sundial-shaped building. It'll be the sequencer's new favorite project, one of the engineers tells you. It'll keep them out of our hair for a while. Azimuth. Azimuth is an enormous sundial without shadow. Its roof topped by a golden shark fin... Nomen? Oh, it's pronounced Nomon. It's the projecting 
piece on a sundial that shows the time by the position of its shadow. No mon. Okay, I didn't know that's what that was called. Rooftop by Golden Shark Fin Nomon. There are still racks of yellowed pamphlets on the walls. It once served as a kiosk selling tickets to sunspotters, the pilgrims and tourists that were expected to flock here. These days, it's more like a temple. Frescoes on the curved walls depict the triumph of the new sun over the old. A figure in a yellow collared protective suit is delivering a sing-song sermon to mostly empty pews. The dazzled sequencer looks up, delighted at your approach, and hurriedly wraps, you, wraps up his speech. He offers you tea with a flash of two white teeth. That's two white as in T-O-O. -O. The teeth are two white. The dazzled sequencer. Aren't the sequencers a religious or cult faction? Wasn't there like a fight that I tried to break up in London between the sequencers and some other group that I failed at? I'm guessing by the fact that they're here and delivering a sermon, they are probably the cult that loves the sun. Loves suns, or maybe the clockwork sun specifically, I don't know. Ask the dazzled sequencer about his role on the sun. The only other people up here are disturbed prisoners and exhausted engineers. The sequencer's function. I'm a priest of the new sequence, declares the sequencer. The brightest truth, the wildfire that has swept Albion. He points out at the expanse of the sun. There burns a beacon, a savior, an aspect of God. We venerate the clockwork sun and its immortal architect, our empress. I'm here to greet pilgrims and safeguard the souls of our engineers. Azimuth is also the only access route to the sun shattered dome, an exhibition hall that was built back when we received more visitors. The dome is terribly dangerous and I advise you to avoid it, no matter how much you hear about the priceless artifacts inside. Priceless artifacts? Thank you for telling me about the priceless artifacts inside. I definitely won't go there. The sequencer has a request. Together we can help the less fortunate, he says. You'll be compensated for your time. Oh, yeah, I should mention, by the way, what they just talked about, about the role in the sun. They definitely are a cult or religion or whatever that um, venerates and... and Praise to the Clockwork Sun specifically. There are many poor souls out there in need of our help. Beleaguered, ignorant masses. I've never met them, but I am assured they exist. He pauses to wipe his eyes. When we lift them from their contemptible state, perhaps they will come to appreciate the greatness of the sequence. He sends an orderly to fetch a wooden crate. Once it's set down before him, he wraps the lid proudly. Six hundred manuals on how to correctly tie a bow tie. Deliver these to Brabus on Workworld, and I'm sure they'll be immensely benefited by their improved understanding of etiquette. Okay, fuck the sequencers. I now have a well-intentioned package. Sure, I don't know if I'm going to deliver that. Definitely not going to go out of my way to do it. What does this require? You unlock this with... Oh, four crew. I thought it required 11. That would be scary if it did. You unlock this with 31 terror. You needed 100 at most. Wait, 100 at most? Can you have above 100 terror? I thought you just, like, die if you get to 100 terror. Huh. Um, I'm gonna come back here and request access later. Um, head towards Azimuth. Need the strength of the sun 40. Wait, so now it says head towards Azimuth rather than go to the sequencer. It's still going to the sequencer though, right? Yeah, it is. Let's visit the glass house. There's a dozen signs warning you to stay away, each more insistent than the last. The engineers shout, but they're too busy to stop you. An isolated section of the abandoned exhibition halls has been repurposed to hold not treasures, but prisoners. Each wears a gray smock rather than a protective suit, leaving them utterly undefended from the ravages of sunlight. They sit slumped in unlocked cells, making no effort to escape. Where would they go? What the fuck? Are they just torturing these prisoners? What are the effects of the sunlight? 
I mean, I'm sure it's not just a sunburn, right? <laughs> it's, no, there's more going on. There's something very wrong with the light from this damn thing. Some of the prisoners are shining at the seams. Some have eyes of curdled glass. A fractured face turns to watch you. A few are singing in praise of the sun, mouths bloody and throats tattered. You should perhaps be horrified, but the song wraps tender cords around your mind and numbs you. Glass crunches underfoot. When you lift your boot, you discover a cracked ear beneath. Ah, uh, okay, I have a bunch of things to say. One, this is a disturbingly good sentence. Eyes of curdled glass. That is really disturbing. Mixing glass and curdled. Ugh. Um, secondly, yes, the light from this thing is definitely the thing causing stuff in Albion to become glass-like. I don't think there was any of this glass stuff in the Reach, right? But there's a huge amount of it here in Albion, and especially right around the Clockwork Sun. It's definitely causing this weird glass effect. Which means something like the Clockwork Sun, some property of its light is probably the thing that caused Elizabeth and their chest to start turning to glass. It couldn't have been the Clockwork Sun itself, right? I, I doubt it, because they started getting the glass ailment pretty, pretty soon, relatively soon after they entered the skies, and I'm sure the Clockwork Sun took a while to build. Can speak of the prisoners. Approach the half, half glass empty. Hurry away from this place. Uh, let's speak with them. Thirty-one percent chance of success. That's not good. They either scream or sing. You may not get anything halfway lucid from them. Failure. <clears throat> scream and song. You sit beside a wild, bearded prisoner, whose entire lower body has turned to glass, fixing him forever in a cross-legged pose. One crystalline hand, vitrified at the wrist, has been fused to his knee. He mumbles a half-coherent account of what he's seen happen to his fellow prisoners, and what he fears will happen to him. Before he can conclude his story, he breaks into a song, the high notes coinciding with pulses of sudden bright sunlight. Jesus fucking Christ. Approach the half-glass empty. That's a, an interesting name. Is that the name of the person? Half glass? Only one cell is locked, and the man within is neither singing nor screaming. The left half of his body is shimmering, translucent. Oh, look at that portrait. Only the flesh and muscle of his left half has vitrified, not the bones and blood within. The glass is suffused with a thousand fine frozen capillaries like delicate red cracks running through ice. He fixes you with an anguished stare. Get me out of here. Why is his cell locked and his alone? This was an exhibition hall once, never a prison. An engineer must have had to install those bars especially for him. The Empty's Conviction The others would not leave even if they could. Their minds are lost. The Empty attempts a one-sided shrug. And, well, the Empire sent me here because I was smuggling sunlight from the Neath back before the horizon closed. When I sold it, I told my customers that the light from the clockwork sun was toxic, and true sunlight was the only cure. Ended up causing a minor panic in London. I think one of the engineers locked me in because he took offense at my criticism, though. He gestures at his vitrified body. I stand by it. Okay, I really need to get this person out. I mean, obviously, the clockwork sun's light is toxic. Jesus. Agree to help the empty escape. A barely perceptible nod, the glass in his neck creaks. Half a smile. Thank you. His voice is hoarse and he speaks in barely a whisper. You'll need to find a permit for my release and present it to the steward. Forged? Legitimate? I don't care. You'll need to acquire three ministry-approved permits and present them to the broken steward to secure the half-glass empty's release. That is such a cool name. So their name is Empty or The Empty, and they are made of half-glass. So, <laughs> half-glass, empty. That That is such an amazing name. And uh, I actually already have the permits, so I think we can do this right now. 
Let's leave. Uh, where do I go to present the things? Who do I... Like, where do I go to present the things to the person exactly? It's not Azimuth. There's nobody there. I already went to the glass house. I guess the vault? Descend to the... Turpus Core Vault. The vault's blower safer, protected by a dozen layers of stained glass. The Turpus Core Vault. Beneath the machine bristling surface, you find a ring of nine vault doors, each engraved with the name of a classical muse. Eight are locked and barred, behind signs saying things like vacant or under renovation, or in one case, unfortunate chronological discrepancies. The ninth, marked Turpus Core, is the only door open to you. When you enter, your footsteps ring through dusty barracks and abandoned canteens. There are engineers' quarters, but they're all on the surface, working, except one. The broken steward has been working on the sun since before it first shone. She has been here far, far longer than any of the engineers above. That's such a cool portrait. The broken steward makes her way carefully towards you, cane clacking on the floor. She has a markedly stiff-limbed gait, and her arms creak as she removes her helmet. Hmm. Given their name and that description and the fact that they've been here longer than anybody else, and their whole body seems to be covered, I'm guessing they worked here before people working on the Clockwork Sun knew what precautions to take and knew that the sun was toxic. So I'm guessing they've turned to glass partially. Speak with the broken steward. She smiles. Her teeth glint oddly. She catches you glancing in her mouth and smiles even wider. Her teeth are shards of cracked glass protruding at odd angles from her gums. Yeah. It's not just the teeth, she says with a brusque air that brooks no sympathy. Damned sun turned my bones as well. Terrible nuisance, really. It gets in the way of work. You notice her fixed neck, her stiff limbs, her careful movements. It's not too bad, she says. Good thing I like soup. Bring three permits to the broken steward. One to authorize the release of the half-glass empty. One to authorize the authorization. A third to confirm that the authorization has been authorized. <coughs> the steward takes the permits, shuffles through them, then drops them straight into a waste paper bin. It seems to be in order, she says. I don't know why we were tasked with keeping prisoners here anyway. As far as I'm concerned, my job is to keep the... The... Bali lights on? Bali. Not mess around in politics. Come on, I need to supervise releases personally. Not that it's ever come up before. Her mouth is a grim line as she redons her helmet. With the occasional hiss of pain, she makes her way up to the surface. Entering the glass house, the steward can only stare in horror at the state of the prisoners. Has she really been so isolated until now? The sun, she mutters. Broken, hateful thing. Damn it. Silently, she unlocks the empty cell. Then she quickly turns to leave. You hear something shatter. She limps away, knee crunching, leaning heavily on her cane. Duh. The empty steps carefully from his cell. Half his face is contorted with rage and grief and relief. The other half is impassive. Thank you, says the free prisoner. He pauses, struggling with himself, and then simply repeats, Thank you. Shuffling awkwardly, partly assisted by your crew, the half-glass empty boards your train. He doesn't know where he wants to go, yet, he says, just away. Yeah, I mean, what, <laughs> what the hell do you do with your life now? I don't know, but definitely get the fuck away from this thing. Okay, so you let... The, like, you're... <laughs> They were surprised at the state of the prisoners? Didn't think you maybe should check up on the welfare of your prisoner? You fucking... God damn. They really are just torturing the prisoners. Do they even feed them, then? Do they not need food? Are they fed by the toxic sun or something? What the fuck? <sighs> okay, well, I guess the only thing left to do... Is ask... Uh, no, uh, request access to the Sun Shattered Dome. Beyond Azimuth lies the maze of abandoned exhibition halls crowned by a magnificent broken dome. Reluctant Ascent 
The sequencer obviously takes his role as gatekeeper seriously. He fusses around you, checking you and your crew's gear, tucking on straps, checking for rips, wiping your stained glass goggles with a silk handkerchief. All the while, he spouts an endless stream of warnings. Don't enter the... Don't enter the... Shalimar. Never travel in a group of three or fewer. And resist the urge to sing, no matter how fiercely your throat burns. And for sequence's sake, watch the condition of your suit. With that, he pats you on the back, hands your brochure, and sends you through the heavy iron door to the dome. Okay, I should probably actually pay attention to those warnings. Don't enter the Shalimar. Don't be in a group of three or fewer. So minimum of four people, don't enter the Shalimar and don't sing. Exhibition halls built to accommodate Sun's Butter tourists and Sequence pilgrims and abandoned after the dangers of the sun became impossible to hide. Priceless paintings hang in bleached rags. Magnificent relics have been left to accumulate glittering glass dust. Is anything less, is anything still intact? The stained glass sky has collapsed and unfiltered sunlight gnaws savagely at your hazard suit. It is currently undamaged, though a little shabby. You find your path blocked by a tangle of bleached white foliage. The Shalimar Garden exploded from its greenhouse long ago, feeding furiously on the sun's light until it swelled to a jungle. Well, they said don't explore the Shalimar. Also, I have a 37% chance of success. Let's... no. Let's search elsewhere. It will cost valuable time and entail greater risk, but treasure beckons around the next corner. You know it. Um, so this is the same, the same, the same, and I guess I should always check how it uh, talks about the state of my suit. It's currently undamaged. A scream. One of your crew is staring in horror at her hand, which has suddenly shriveled and sprouted liver spots. The light can do strange things to the flow of time, and you seem to have strayed into a bad patch. Okay, good, so it's not permanent. Uh, hmm. Should we try to navigate the bad patch? 76% chance of success. It's about the best I'm going to get, because it uses my mirrors. Yeah, sure. If you're careful, you can avoid the worst of it. Partial success. You guide your crew through the patch of lumpy time. Once everyone is through, you find yourself in an area of the dome seemingly untouched by previous explorers. A quick search uncovers an in intact exhibit, a shroud of fabric that even here ravenously consumes light. On the return journey, however, you run into trouble. The stoker carrying the bombazine makes a misstep and begins to wail as his leg withers and rots beneath him. Unbalanced, he falls forward and the bombazine tumbles from his grip. Oh, my choice is either basically go for the money, try to catch the bombazine, or help the crew member. Of course I'm going to help the crew member, Christ. Elizabeth, Elizabeth isn't just totally greedy. Yeah, catch the crew member, life before profit. Crew member sobs in relief, clutching tightly at your suit. The bombazine unravels instantly to an ancient, valueless scrap. Your suit has been damaged, a few panels have loosened, and the joints are fraying. Starting to get a feel for how this works. Kind of like a keep trying for treasure if you want, but it gets more and more dangerous as you go. It's currently battered, my suit. Soon you stumble upon a gleaming forest of glass sculptures. As you get closer, you realize they were once tourists, from back when the exhibition was still open to the public. What were they clustered around? Ooh, uses... Uses veils, but I only have a 48% chance of success. So this must be a harder challenge than the previous one. Years of harsh sunlight have sharpened the statues, turning elbows and fingertips to razors. You'll need to be agile to reach the other side unscathed. Yes, success! crowd of glass. The vitrified tourists are arranged in a circle. Whatever lies at the center must be where the good gawk. It's a nightmare in the bulky hazard suit, but you duck and weave through the statues with only a few rips to your rigging. When you reach the middle, you find a plinth upon which rests a pale pink mask. When you frown, the mask's mouth turns up at a smile. <laughs> suit has been damaged, the stained glass goggles are cracked. And a sleeve is torn up the elbow. Got an otherworldly artifact. Hmm. 
A scream. One of your crew staring in horror at her hand. Uh, that's the same as before. Ah, so we have another bad patch. Okay, I'll go a little bit further. Let's do one more. Success. So this one should be better than last time, right? You got your crew through the patch of lumpy time. Careful, a spot where fallen shards in the ceiling have turned to sand. Here, watch your step. Discarded Taurus pamphlet is still frozen mid-fall. <laughs> there are a few missteps, but your hazard suit takes the brunt of it. Once everyone is through, you find yourself in an area of the dome untouched by previous explorers. Uh, same thing about the, the shroud. You hear one of your crew gulp. Now for the return journey. Ah, uh, now that... I think now that my... Um suit is split a bit and sunlight seeps into your skin. I think I'm starting to gain terror. I think that's the thing that happens. And I now have a roll of Thirsty Bombazine. That's why it's called Thirsty. It's thirsty because it drinks up the sun, right? Yeah, so before this was a partial success, so I guess what happens with a partial success is... Like, the same sort of thing where you get a chance to get the thing, but instead of just getting the thing like I did, you then have to pass, like, another skill check. Choose to either save your crew and lose the Bombazine, or save the Bombazine and lose the crew, that sort of thing. Okay, sunlight's getting through. Let's return to safety. Alright, well, looks like that's everything we can do with the Clockwork Sun for the moment. I think this is a pretty good place to end the episode. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return... Well, I mean, my hole's in pretty good shape. My tears, it's a little bit high, but it's manageable. Got a good amount of supplies, and I can buy more fuel here. So I think I'm going to explore around the Clockwork Sun.